Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you uh, this morning uh, through all of our social media stuff as well. Um, I'm excited this morning to just kind of uh, be back from vacation. And I, I have several thank yous that I wanted to share today. So uh, I just wanted to take a moment and first say thank you to everyone who was able to serve for our Law Appreciation Day. Uh, we served two Polk County Sheriff substations in the Winter Haven area. Uh, that was a great success. The folks that cooked and took the food and hosted and those that prayed, uh, it was a great success. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Also, there are two more substations that we are going to bless with a meal, whether that be a lunch time for one or a dinner time for others. So we'll keep you posted as far as that. Second thing, I wanted to thank all of you once again for stalking the mission. Uh, we do not compete with other churches. We simply do our part. Uh, Thrive is not a big church, you know, but we do our part and I think God uses us in a wonderful way. And uh, David, who runs the mission, wanted me to personally thank you guys uh, for your donations and everything that, um, that we've been able to, to make happen down there in downtown Winter Haven. The third thank you this morning is I want to thank you again for those that were able to help Miss Phyllis, uh, one of our widows in the church, uh, get moved. And so thank you to uh, those folks that were able to help her uh, to get relocated. Uh, she is a wonderful person. And so uh, we wanted to thank everybody who participated in that, along with Miss Sandy Driggers. Um, she also is one of ours. She had lost her husband, uh, Gary Driggers, who went home to be with the Lord uh, a while back. And so um, we're still keeping Sandy in our prayers and, and trying to stay in contact. Please pray for these women. Uh, they love the Lord. And um, it doesn't mean that the devil is going to back off because they both have suffered losses. So please keep Phyllis and Sandy in your prayers. Then fourthly, I want to send out a big thank you to Joshua who filled the pulpit for me while I was gone and was able to go up into Idaho and Montana and just relax and see some of the mountains and do a little bit of fishing and some R&R. &R. Uh, I never have to worry about you guys being fed when Joshua fills the pulpit. So a big thank you to Joshua as well. And then uh, thank you to everyone that came to the workday. Uh, this past Saturday, we had a workday on the church campus inside and outside, and we were able to uh, once again thoroughly clean the church. Uh, we did a lot of landscaping work, and uh, a, a lot of people worked very hard. Thank you for caring about God's church. Haggai chapter 1 was the verse that we used this time around um, that spoke to um, taking care of our homes and neglecting the house of the Lord. And so thank you for the big response in caring for your church and helping to keep the campus beautiful. I, wanna, I really do thank you for that. So, you know, we've done quite a bit, believe it or not, from prayer caravans to mission food supplies in Winter Haven, uh, to loving on our law enforcement. Um, you know, for a little church, we do our part. So I wanted to take some time here out of the sermon this morning and to, and to thank a bunch of people. Look forward to seeing you all very soon. Uh, we know our governor, DeSantis, moved us to phase three here in the state of Florida. And so uh, that has brought a breath of relief to a lot of people. Um, this past Sunday, we allowed uh, the greeting to take place, uh, and it, it really just kind of filled up the room with a lot of love. And we, it's all voluntarily. If people felt that they still wanted to just kind of sit in private, they could. But if they wanted to get up and shake hands or say hi to a neighbor, that was also welcomed as well. So we're praying for you um, as you prepare mentally, physically, and spiritually. Uh, to make your way back to the house of God, uh, where we are at Thrive and Winter Haven. Uh, we look forward to your return, and we pray for you each and every week. So this morning is, is somewhat of a side, standalone sermon. I know we've been working very diligently through the book of Acts, and um, I wanted to share a little bit more on my heart personally 
today. I've titled this Exposing the Enemy of the Cross, which is the devil. Um, and we all recognize that, that we have an enemy. Uh, the Bible uh, calls his name uh, Satan, Lucifer, the adversary. Um, the big question is we know what he does and we know who he is. But the question today is how does he do it? You know, how does he get done what he wants to get done? We all that walk with Jesus know he's wrong, but he is very clever in how he does it. So we want to look at some things today. What, what are the ways and methods that the enemy uses to attack uh, and try to get us off course? Um, thought about that while I was away this past week, and, and so uh, we'll come back next week to the book of Acts. I wanted to share this today. We may not get through all the questions uh, but they're from my heart, some things I've battled through the years, and I, I hope it might be beneficial to you. Uh, it's very important to understand the enemy's methods, because when you do, you can be on guard and always ready to fight back and counter. So I believe that the devil is really after three things in your life, in mine, but three things. I believe it's your relationship, your walk with God. I believe it's your fellowship your communion with others in the body of Christ in the church, uh, those that are around you in your neighborhoods and amongst you in the marketplace in the city. And then thirdly, your discipleship, your commitment to fulfill God's purpose for your life. Well, whether you know it or not, you were put on this earth by God and He breathed life into you that you truly um, have a purpose um, and some work to do while you're here. So your relationship, your fellowship, and your discipleship. One of the ways the enemy works to attack these areas of our lives is by planting little seeds of doubt. You've all experienced that. Oftentimes he does it in the form of a question. Now that's exactly how he did it in the garden with Adam and Eve. And he started off by, did God really say? Well, that alone, those four words, really begin to pull us away from everything that God did say. What did He really say? Well, let's scrutinize that. Let's look a little deeper here. Um, you know, He did it to Adam and Eve. He did it to Jesus. And as long as He lives, He's going to do it to you and me. So the way He operated then is still how He operates now, today in 2020. These seeds of attack in our minds, one or all three of these areas in your life is going to happen. Uh, and sometimes it's all three. Sometimes it's one. Sometimes it's two. If we're not careful, these little seeds of doubt that we don't check and take root, and then we begin to breathe life into them. They can latch on to our thinking. They can cripple us, leading us to be very unproductive, to become very unhealthy in our thought life that over time, that is the enemy's goal, is to move you or your loved ones away from God. The best way to defend yourself is to recognize what are some of the questions and the tactics that the enemy uses. For this reason, I jotted down a few that I want to share with you this morning um, that Satan would ask you to mess with your mindset. And so... Let me start with this first one, you know, because it's so important to salvation. Um, did God really forgive you? Did God really forgive you? One of the tricks that Satan often uses is to get you and me to believe that either God hasn't forgiven you or that He just can't forgive you because your sin is so dark and so gross. Um, that is a lie. The problem with this feeling of unforgiveness is that it pushes us away from God. Now, another word for this is condemnation. And the Bible speaks about condemnation. Condemnation doesn't make you want to draw close to God, does it? No. It makes you want to run as far away as possible. Remember, that, that's what Adam and Eve felt in the garden, and that is really what caused them to hide when God the Father came looking for them. He knows, the enemy knows, if he can get us to think these types of thoughts, 
that we will question God's ability and God's willingness to forgive us. This will have devastating effects on our walk with God. We won't pray. We won't worship. We won't take the time to read the Bible, not to read it just for the sake of reading, but to understand the heart of God. You know, that strengthens me. You know, faith cometh by hearing, but by hearing what? The Word of God, the truth of God. So here are two verses that I think will help you root out this seed. And one is found in Romans 8, 1, probably very familiar to you. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to the woman that was caught in adultery. Um, Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? They had all gone away. There was no condemnation. There was no one there condemning the woman. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And then the second passage I find very important in this area of doubt from the enemy, you know, did God really forgive you, is 1 John 1, 9. You know that very well. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, we can be confident today that God is not only able to forgive, He is also willing to to forgive. God wants to forgive and love His children. When God forgives you and me, He wipes the slate clean and doesn't remember our sins anymore. And we're told in Psalms 103, in verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. We're forgiven. We're free. We are not condemned. The second question I want to run by you this morning is, does God really love me? Have you ever had that thought? Does God really love you? I'm sure at some point in time, whether it was when you were in sin or you've fallen short in some way, shape, or form, um, you know, the enemy tries to say, does God really love you? If God really loved you, He would, and then the blank is open. Now, first and foremost, we all should know the cross demonstrated God's greatest love for us and that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross for not just my sins and your sins, but the sins of all that would believe on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. Many times this question rolls around in our heads, especially when a major disappointment or tragedy happens in your life. You begin to wonder if, if God's love is, is really real. After all, if God really loved me, then why did this happen? Or why did God allow this to happen? Why did I lose my spouse? Why did I lose my baby? Why did I lose that job? Why are we losing our home? Why are we in it? And the list goes on and on and on. And the devil's always going to say that. But God also spoke in the same chapter of Romans, but in the fifth chapter, in the eighth verse, and he said, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. If he didn't do anything else but die on the cross, that's enough. Jesus is enough. Proof of God's love for me and for you isn't that everything always goes the way we want it to go. It doesn't always go right in our lives. We have to remember that we still live in a fallen, sinful world. And although I, although I am forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future, I have to understand that the very proof of God's love when I fall short is that He dealt with our greatest need, which was our sinful condition. If He would have left us in that condition, we would have been separated from Him forever. That's the message that I wish and pray that people on this earth would understand. The Bible is mocked and ridiculed, and in limited humanity, men and women challenge God, His nature, as if they are smarter than God, bigger than God, wiser than God. It's just not true. 
The cross of Christ was and forever will be the greatest evidence of God, how much He loves us. Now, the third question that is a problem oftentimes is when we are wronged, right? Why did that person do that? Why did that person hurt me? Whether that is a child or whether that is a spouse or an employer or another Christian, I will tell you the whys of life never get answered. But if you ask what, what can I learn from this God? What can I do to make this right? God is very quick to answer that. When people wrong us, it always tends to lead to speculation and accusation. I heard from someone who said this, without complete information, any conclusion you come to is probably false. Without, think about that now, without all the evidence that we need, without the complete information, any conclusion that we come to is probably false. When we question the motives of a person without talking to that person, how often have we done that? We've already thought they meant it this way, in a text, in an email, and that's not how they meant it at all. You know, people always tend to read negativity into text and emails or letters instead of going straight to the author and asking them, hey, what did you mean when you said this? So we get in trouble when we do that. This is right up the devil's alley. He loves that. If someone you know does something wrong or does wrong to you, don't ask yourself why, but ask them why. Why did you do that? Or why did you hurt me? It's always better to go directly to them and ask that question. It's probably, most of the times, not anything like you were thinking. This one act alone creates a potential open door, you know, either for unity or for division with friends, family, other Christians. It's a very dangerous place to be. So be careful when that rolls around. Now, another question that I've battled through the years that I thought worth writing down is, do you really believe God is going to come through for you? You ever been there? Thought about that, right? In times of great need. Either God comes through or this is not going to happen. Could be with a home, a car, a disease. Do you really believe God is going to come through for you? The devil loves using that one. You know what that is? That is a question of God's faithfulness and his ability to take care of you and me. If Satan can get you or me to question God's faithfulness, then that tends to lead to worry, anxiety, stress, and sometimes even depression. None of these are healthy and none are good for us. Consider God's promise in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 5. For He has said, I will never, under any circumstances, desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Now that's from the Amplified Version. We should let that resonate in our hearts for a while. If anybody could keep a promise, it's God. And God promised, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. It's a great reminder to me. When you hit different seasons of life, you can know the word forward and backwards. But the devil always antes up and always comes with a different trial. But here's what God said, and he said it through the prophet Isaiah. And I always try to put my name in there. And so I encourage you to put your name in there. Isaiah 43, verse 2 says this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. So when I pray, I pray that, Bobby, when you pass through the waters, Jesus said He's going to be with you. Bobby, when you go through the fire, Jesus said He's going to be with you. You won't be burned. You won't drown. I like that. Here's another big one. 
See if the devil's whispered this to you before. No one understands what I'm going through. That's a big one. My wife doesn't understand what I'm going through. My husband doesn't understand what I'm going through. My pastor doesn't understand what I'm going through. My children don't understand what I'm going through. And that alone moves us into a self-centeredness. And it takes the focus off of God and puts it back on us. And now we start looking at our view, our human view, and not God's view in our situation. That's a, that's a big question to answer. And, you know, sometimes those little whispers will attack us when we're in a difficult place. The goal here is to isolate you. Isolate you from God's presence because, well, the dark whisper in our ears or the other little thought voice in our head from the devil, you know, oh, well, God doesn't understand. No one understands. They just don't know what you're feeling or what you're going through. That's very common, even in addicts, that nobody in the family and no professional can absolutely, not even God can understand what they're going through. And Christians, you know, people blame God, you know, whether they're Christians or not. They blame pastors, they blame churches, uh, they blame society, they blame a relative. You know, we have to own some things in our lives and what we've done. And a lot of people, when they get into this question answering thing with the devil, the goal is to just quit. See, God's not going to come through for you. That's what Satan wants you to believe, that God's a failure. And God isn't a failure. He's a failure. The devil's a failure. We're trying to get to heaven, and he was already in heaven. You couldn't get any closer, that fallen angel, to God. And yet he thought he was going to be God and be like God. And in the end, there's only one God. And he's not sharing that glory and that power and that authority with anybody. And the Bible speaks to this as well as our high priest. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he never sinned once. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4, verse 15 and 16. And Ecclesiastes has a great verse that will help in this, answer this question as well. In chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other one up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. So even if everybody walked away from us, we're not alone because God promised to never walk away from us. Although the 12 apostles did walk away from him, and think about this, everybody that Jesus Christ ever healed didn't stand up to help him or support him. I always ask, where were they at? The, the, the blind that now see, the lame that now walk, the 10 lepers that were healed, only one came back. Many people were healed by Jesus that did not continue on in, in salvation. They just received the blessing and walked away. And God, in His great mercy and infinite wisdom, understands all of this. And He has placed people around us, some that will walk away and some that will be faithful and true. But if you feel like there aren't anybody, any people around, or any strong Christians or mentors to lead you, pray and ask God to bring them into your life. And I've prayed this before, and God did it for me, and I know that God will do it for you. Do you really think that you can do that? That's a big one. Why would God use you? Do you really think you can do that for God? Do you really think? See, it's just a constant. It just keeps grinding down. Do you No, I know what the Bible says. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it is no longer I that live, right? We're told in Galatians, but Christ who lives in me. When the Word of God flows in our hearts, the enemy is really trembling because he's losing his grip on his lie. And every time we do sin, we're believing the lie. Be confident, Paul told the Philippians in the first chapter in the sixth verse. 
Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. I can't tell you how many times I rely on that. I don't have it in me. I don't have the strength to persevere. I don't have enough prayer time. It's not pray harder. It's not read your Bible more, though maybe some of us do need to do both. But that doesn't dictate God's love and how God moves on our life and on our behalf. God's doing a work in us. And I think Philippians 1, 6 answers that. It's worth it. Absolutely, it's going to be worth it. So sometimes in life, we all face discouragement. You're going to toil, work hard, give your best. After doing all that, you may not get the result that you wanted. After pouring your heart and soul into whatever you're doing, someone can make you feel unappreciated or of little value or worth. In moments like these, the devil may whisper this thought, is it really worth the effort? What's the point of me trying to read my Bible, spend time in prayer to get to know God, not to get something from God, but to get to know Him. Recognize that accomplishing God's purpose in life, this life, will come with a lot of bumps and bruises. I was going to say some, but it comes with a lot of bumps and bruises. There's no greater impact that any of us will have or greater joy that we will ever find accomplishing God's will for our life. That, that is everything. Whether your family, your career, your ministry, there's no greater fulfillment to know that, that you did something for God and that God used you to do it. Uh, it's amazing. So I hope the words of God will encourage you here. Paul told the Corinthians, and I'm reading out of 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, and 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 17. Let these words resonate with you. We are hard-pressed on every side. Now look back the last six months of what we walked through. We are hard-pressed on every side. And I mean from the government down to the local store, from the school house to the White House. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed every day by the Spirit of God through regeneration. You and I can overcome the devil's schemes because Christ is the answer, and the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to do this. So when the devil lies to you this week and causes doubt, or ask some of those questions, and there are many other questions that the enemy will ask you and me. You must be able to counter that with the Word of God and truth. I encourage this week that you do that. Now, I want to close with this. You know, I think about all the things that the devil has done and the garbage that builds up in my life. And on my computer, at the very bottom of my PC, and if you look on your computer this week, you'll see a trash can at the bottom right of your computer. And periodically, I get a lot of trash that accumulates in that can, and I just find my mouse, and then with a click of the button, I can empty that trash. A little bit different when I'm dealing with my personal life and my sins. I wish I had a button to click that would make me righteous, or a button to click that would make me holy, but I don't. And it was the cross of Jesus Christ. You probably didn't know this. But the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has been the biggest trash man on the planet. What? You're calling him a trash man? Listen, every time I sin, it's the Lord who needs to come and take out my trash and grab my garbage. We, the world, we, humanity, put all the trash and garbage of sin on Christ on Calvary's hill. And it's only through his blood that we are forgiven. That's why we remembered the cross that's why Sunday we celebrate communion. And I want to invite you to come. The last Sunday of each month is Breaking Bread Sunday. I've already heard some great reports that if you sign up on Monday before Communion Sunday, which is the last Sunday of the month, we assign you if you want to participate. You don't have to. And we assign you someone to go to break bread with. It's called Breaking Bread Sunday. So after Communion, we go celebrate at lunch. And I already heard from several how wonderful that was and how they love that it increases our fellowship and our discipleship. 
just being able to each month now um, participate in communion. So we want to invite you when you're ready, come back to church, participate in that. You know, I was thinking about this. I saw a movie with Will Smith, and I'm going to wrap this up quickly. It was called The Gemini Man. There's a scene in the movie where he said these words. He said a Russian guy, he was a Russian mafia guy talking to Will Smith. He says, you know, the problem with you Americans is this. When somebody shoots at you or you have a bad day, you get really whiny and want to cry. And he said, we Russians just call that Tuesday. So you must get used to getting hit. Stay with Jesus. Read the word this week. Get in alone with him in prayer. That's what I'm going to do. And you will absolutely have a great week. God bless you. And I'm looking forward to your return. We'll talk again soon. Bye for now.